Good morning. Welcome to the Lake County Master Gardener Volunteers Meet Us in the Garden. As you know, we're going to be talking about perennials and annuals that are new this year. Um, my name is Robin McNaught, and my accomplice is Midge Maramore. We worked together on this. Midge had this fun, I fun idea that we should talk about some of the new annuals and perennials that will be available this spring. And yet, here I am talking to you. I think she's very clever. Okay, I'd like to start by taking a brief look at what goes into creating new annuals and perennials that, that tempt us each year. How do, we, how do they come about and what makes a plant a cultivar? And then we'll take a look at how you can choose between new plants wisely so that you don't fall for the first one you see, whether it works in your yard or not. And we'll discuss some of the things to consider before selecting things like soil and zone or climate, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but just a reminder. And then we'll look at determining right place, right plant in more detail as we show you some of the plants that we thought looked pretty nifty for this spring. When we get to the point of discussing the plants themselves, please bear in mind that it's not our intention to promote a particular nursery and we don't actually know if these plants are all available or any of them are available in this area. We also don't claim in any way to, to present a comprehensive list of new cultivars. There's an impressive number of cultivars available each year. Um, we're just scratching the surface and hopefully whetting your appetite. Our interest today is in providing you with an understanding of what goes into creating new plants, and an understanding of how to successfully select among the new offerings that are available. You'll see that on your labels that soil requirements may be listed. For example, the plant requires acid soil or it would prefer not to be planted in acid soil. Maybe it prefers loamy or sandy soil. Will the spot you have chosen provide that optimal nutrition and drainage conditions for your new plant? one of the very first things to consider. To determine the condition of the soil, if you're not familiar with it, it's always best to uh, do a soil test. Different areas in your yard may actually test differently, so you can't really say, eh, I checked the front, I know it's whatever. You need to check the area that you're going to be planting. Even within a relatively small area in Lake County, particularly, the soil seems to range from clay to sand. Um, there's quite a variety in our area. So as you can see, the Lake County um, Master Gardeners, we got a helpline. Some of you picked up the helpline flyer from the table back there. We have a helpline available to answer questions and the handouts are available on the table there. You can purchase a soil test kit from the Lake County Master Gardeners. <laughs> Master Gardener volunteers, that's a little too long for, for real speech. Um, when you send a $10 fee to receive the uh, test, you can then s take the sample, send it in on your own, and get the results sent back to you. If the results don't make any sense to you, please feel free to use the helpline. That's the type of question it's there for. Okay, let's look at climate. Obviously, the second we looked at soil, um, second major factor is the climate or your zone. And you need something that can tolerate this climate. Many plants are from the south and have been brought up here and those often become annuals because they can't tolerate our winters. So we need to be aware of what our zone is, what, what the plant will or won't tolerate. As you'll see, we go in our state from 5B to 6B. The increments between 5 and 6, that increment is 10 degrees, let me say this correctly, of average low temperature. Okay. And the A and the B break it down to a five degree increment. So we have quite a range, particularly as you get up toward the lake. I think I've seen even more specific 
images than this. Um, so you might want to, to look into where, specifically where you are. The changes in the temperature often are attributed to taking into account things like how close you are to a body of water, the elevation, and those obviously vary quite a bit here, and create microclimate effects. So if you believe that something uh, didn't do too well in that spot last year, it may be a microenvironment uh, in, your, in your yard. You wanna, you wanna believe what you see, so. Genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is the range of different inherited traits that occur within a species. We've been discussing factors which, can control, which we can control for, soil and the environment when we make our choice, in order to provide optimal growing conditions. The rest of the situation is controlled by nature, by factors intrinsic to that species of plant. Well, with help from a lab in an increasing number of cases. Plants that have been assisted by a lab are called cultivars, and those that are naturally occurring are considered uh, varieties. This image of Indian paintbrush shows the range of different traits or variations that can occur in nature in one species. As a plant evolves, it adapts and strengthening its ability to resist conditions such as pests, diseases, changes in climate, and its appearance and de uh, also develops various colors and so forth. I, I love this because it's hard to believe that the range in one plant is that broad, it's just in terms of the colors that we're looking at. So this, this is a variety, okay? A plant within a species, uh, a version of a plant within a species is a variety. A cultivar, on the other hand, does not occur naturally. Its development is the result of a work of a, in a lab environment by horticulturists. Their work is aimed at maintaining and expanding the genetic diversity of the plant by strengthening attributes beneficial to its survival through effective breeding. Because plants are critical for the survival of our species, this is an important <laughs> industry, developing cultivars. You can imagine that a great deal of time, effort, and money is spent in developing plants that provide better, more sustainable crops. There is an entire industry devoted to breeding plants with the least number of negative factors and the most attractive combination of positive factors. This process produces, as we've said, cultivar, a cultivar. And we benefit greatly by this diversity of plants available to us for planting in our yards. Because of the work involved in producing cultivars through high-tech reproduction methods and long planting and growing trials, many cultivars are patented. I would assume probably most of them are, really. It's a, it's a tedious process. Um, therefore, they are not freely available for further breeding. The work involved in production helps explain why cultivars may seem a little pricey at times, but in effect, we are helping to support the development of the best possible plants. Okay, right plant, right place. This is a display of some of the attributes that a horticulturist <laughs> might be trying to develop in a cultivar. It's moisture loving. It likes sun or shade. Can take either. The bloom time. Let's extend the bloom time. We don't want it to just bloom for two weeks in July. We want it to bloom from spring till fall. It can survive in acid soil, um, or it's not restricted to acid soil. So depending on the plant that they're dealing with, they, these just are some of the traits that they may be looking to improve upon. There will be a list on the label of the plant, which I'm sure you're familiar with reading through, which will tell you 
what basically that plant needs and which, which of these attributes it, it has. Hopefully you're thinking in terms of wants, your wants, and versus the plant's needs. Um, in order to narrow the selection process when choosing a new plant, it's important to define which attri attributes we must have. So if a plant requires moist and shady, we can't put it in the middle of the yard in the sun. Then there are the attributes that we want to have. We might want long blooming, we might want pollinator friendly. It's important to consider which things the plant must have and then look for what you would like to have. And that really is the process of coming up with right plant, right place. You want the plant to be able to thrive. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the plants that are available this spring. This is the Allium Windy City, and it's a low maintenance member of the onion family with dark green grass-like foliage. It grows to approximately 18 inches, which I would call kind of a medium height maybe, and has unusually shaped purple flowers. As you can see, they're kind of uh, like a ball, and they add texture and depth to your garden. Flowers remain for, the full, for a full month in midsummer, and they remain standing as an attractive seed head through the winter. It provides what we would call winter interest. This is the coleus spitfire. It's an annual or a tender perennial, meaning that it will not survive frost. Okay. In fact, it requires heat to thrive and should not be planted outside until the nighttime temperatures are above 60 degrees. So it's a, it's a little touchy as far as temperature is concerned. It only grows to 10 to 16 inches, which is a nice short plant, and has a mounding effect, which you can uh, see in the picture there. It should be kept evenly moist. I'll call it the Goldilocks effect. Not completely dry and not soggy. Okay, Likes to be just so. The flowers spike in purple and blue and require deadheading. Are you all familiar with deadheading, I presume, um, and it's easy to make cuttings from this plant. This is the dragon fruit Rex begonia, and it's another annual which works well in containers because it's a particularly compact form of the begonia. It likes partial shade and moist but well-drained soil. Most plants don't like to have soggy feet. It grows to 14 to 16 inches tall and wide, okay, and makes a nice low maintenance house plant in the winter. Okay, so again, it's an annual. You don't want to leave it out year round. This is one of my favorites, the Jurassic Pterodactyl Eared Lady Fern. Whew, it's a mouthful. Um, it should be bought for its name alone. Um, it likes full shade, full to partial shade, I should say, and moist but well-drained soil. That's, you'll hear that recurring, moist but well-drained. So don't, don't, you want to avoid, with the so type of soil you put the plant in, you want to avoid them sitting in too much water. It is native to Japan and grows 18 inches tall and wide. Apparently it can be toxic if eaten in large quantities by dogs. Hopefully that would not be a problem, but I thought I'd better put that in there. Um, but it does look great in a woodland garden combined with plants like hookera and hosta. The Echinacea Wicked is a perennial, a cone-shaped flower excellent for cut flower arrangements. It grows to 16 inches tall and it pairs well with Rudbeckia in the garden. Butterflies love the flowers, birds love the seeds. And my personal favorite is deer resistant. If you, many of us in this area suffer from too many deer. 
and it will tolerate a hot, dry site. It can be deadheaded to prevent seeding, but the seed heads look nice in the winter and the birds will thank you for the sustenance. Okay, this is the golden tiara princess lily. It gets so tall. It's a perennial which grows initially to two feet tall, but stalks produced later in the summer can achieve three, four, five feet, I'm sorry, three to four feet tall, and it goes about five feet wide, so it's a big plant. This cultivar was bred for greater hardiness. It is unique in its ability to tolerate the climate in our area. Most princess lilies are only hardy to zone seven. So this was tested actually up in Michigan to make sure that it will survive the winter in our area. Okay, the heart-to-heart -heart caladium, I think you can see right there where it gets its name from by the shape of the leaf. In our area, it's an annual outdoors or the bulbs can be taken in before frost and stored or grown as house plants through the winter. If grown indoors, they require a sunny window to thrive. And outdoors, it makes an excellent border plant at a height of 12 to 14 inches. Caladium are very heat tolerant, but the soil needs to be kept moist, but not wet. The Helleborus wedding crasher is not a biennial, as the bee was intended to indicate. Um, it is actually a perennial. They flower early with beautiful three inch double flowers, which are good as cut flowers. The plant grows from 18 to 24 inches tall. And this one's mine. This is my favorite. I don't just want this gem. I need it because they are easy to grow. That's me. Low maintenance. They're deer resistant. They tolerate a wide range of soil. Um, and they're also content with part sun or even full shade, which is a little bit hard to find at times. The soft pink flowers covered with darker pink spots are quite stunning. And the common name is the Lenten Rose because it blooms so early in the year. The Hookera Timeless Night, um, the name refers to the unusually dark shade of the leaves for which the cultivar was bred. If you are familiar with heuchera, you know that there's a wide range of different colors. This is, I would say by far, the, the darkest that I have seen. And it contrasts very nicely with other lighter leaves. The tall pink flowers can be cut for fresh bouquet, um, while the low eight to 10 inch compact mounding form of the foliage means the plant works well as a garden border or in a container. It's easy to maintain and it's long blooming. This is another mouthful. Little Hottie Panicle Hydrangea um, is a shrub. It's three feet to five feet tall and wide, so it's fairly compact. It was originally native to China and Japan. In this cultivar, the profuse blossoms merge, emerge as green but turn bright white. The shrub is heat tolerant and prefers sun to partial shade. And it needs moist but well-drained soil. Kind of a theme here. Um, it requires a minimum of pruning, which is always good news with a shrub, um, to develop into a well-shaped plant which will provide fall color. The Monarda Leading Lady Pink. Common name is bee balm. Okay. It's part of the mint family and it's native to North America. This is not native. This is a cultivar from the native plant. It's a short perennial, only 10 to 14 inches, and it makes an excellent border plant. The fragrant flowers bloom from the first week of June through midsummer, and they attract bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Thus the name, <laughs> Bee Balm. Okay. Um, they great, they're great for cut flower arrangements, 
and uh, they need part to full sun. And again, they're deer resistant and low maintenance. Okay, Flock Sweet Summer Fantasy is a perennial which prefers moist, humus rich soil. It quickly grows to approximately 20 to 24 inches tall by 18 to 22 inches wide. So it's a good sized plant. And it produces fragrant white blossoms with a purple accent in mid to late summer. Butterflies and hummingbirds are both attracted and the blossoms are good for cut flower arrangements. This phlox prefers full sun. The watering needs are moderate, but it will need to be watered weekly or more often in extreme heat or if it's in a container. So I think we're basically saying it's not that heat tolerant. You need to keep after it. This cultivar was developed in part to improve mildew resistance. Don't know if any of you have had a problem with that with flocks. Um, it can be divided every year in spring or fall. Paint the town magenta pinks. Um, this is a dianthus hybrid. Hybrid being another term for cultivar. Crossbreeding of the basic varieties. And it's a perennial which only grows to six to eight inches. It needs partial to full sun. This cultivar has improved heat tolerance and can handle dry soil for short periods. Means that's been a problem with this plant, with this, um, with other varieties of this plant. And the attempt in developing this cultivar was to make it less susceptible to dry, uh, more, more tolerant of the heat. Ideally, soil should be loose with good drainage, okay, and neutral to slightly alkaline. It has a preference there. This is a great border plant which blooms continually from early summer to early fall, which is always nice to know. And the blossoms can provide both cut flowers as well as dried flowers, which can provide winter interest if you leave them on the plant. The blue foliage contrasts nicely with the pink flowers. A little hard to see the foliage there. Is that related to the carnation? Certainly looks like it. Does anybody know? Yes, yes. yes it is? Yes. Okay, okay Salvia Farinacea Sally Fun Pure White. Whew. All right, they're not making this easy. It, this is an annual or a tender perennial. Again, meaning it needs to be brought in if, when it gets cold because its minimum temperature tolerance is 50 degrees. It requires full sun and is drought and heat tolerant with low water requirements. Soil should be allowed to dry between waterings, so you don't want to overwater this one. This salvia grows to a moderate height of 18 to 24 inches and it produces abundant white spikes continuously from late spring into fall. Again, a long span, which is nice. Shadowland Diamond Lake Hosta. I love this one too, just because it's a, got a nice variation. The leaves are corrugated blue foliage and they have wavy margins on them which makes them quite interesting. In summer, it has pale lavender, pollender-friendly flowers. It grows to approximately 17 inches tall, but about 45 inches wide. It's easy to maintain and likes partial to full shade. Again, that's, that's a plus. It's hard to find plants for shade. Moist but well-drained soil along with the removal of dead foliage as needed will both help prevent insect infestation. So when the leaves have gone, um, remove them so that you keep the plant healthy. Okay, Angel Face Cascade Snow. It's a member of the Snapdragon family. 
an annual which works well in containers as well as hanging baskets and especially as it requires no deadheading. It also works well for a border or for ground cover or as a landscape mass planting. Good all-round plant. It loves the sun and is heat and drought tolerant, which means it can even be planted in the heat of summer. It will, it will take. It also will tolerate wet feet, which is not something we've heard about any of the other plants. It will provide long-lasting cut flowers and has an oddly, slightly grape soda fragrance, which I thought was interesting. It grows to between 8 and 14 inches and is long blooming. Stochesia is a native North American wildflower widely grown in the southern states due to its heat tolerance. I believe it is considered a perennial in this area, although it requires some protection from northern winters. This short 14 inch cultivar, Stochesia honey song purple, blooms from midsummer to early fall with large three to four inch flowers with a fanciful fringe that the butterflies love. This plant can handle moist or dry conditions but it is important to provide well-drained soil. Supertunia Priscilla, I love this one too. It's an annual with a mounding trailing habit. It can hang down as much as 30 inches from a basket. It likes partial to full sun and can be used in containers as an edging, a ground cover, or a landscape mass. It's long blooming, heat and drought tolerant. You will not need to deadhead this one. Petunias are my least favorite to deadhead because your hands get so sticky from them. Um, but this does not require deadheading because as the flowers, as the blossoms fade and die, the plant gets rid of them, sloughs them off. So um, they don't need deadheading. And this is the kind of improvement that cultivars uh, develop um, which help us out make our lives simpler and make the plants more enjoyable. The spinning wheels marigold is native to Mexico and Central America which is why our cold climb in our cold climb it's an annual. It has large two and a quarter inch orange flowers which have a twisting and turning effect with the petals which makes it look a bit like fireworks. It attracts a myriad of pollinators and the deer and rabbits tend to avoid it, which we like. This particular plant, from what I was able to find, um, does not appear to be available for purchase in this area except in seed form. Um, I easily could be wrong on that, but I was only able to find uh, places where you could order the seed. The seeds can be sown indoors two to three inches apart and a quarter of an inch deep and should germinate in seven to ten days, at which point the seedlings can be transferred into moist, well-drained soil again. In full sun, they're, they're heat-loving plants. They're quick to bloom, they're easy to take care of. I think this would be kind of a fun one to start, even maybe some winter sowing. Um, give it a try. Okay, the plants we have shown you are touted as new for 2022, but that doesn't mean that they will all be available. Some plants do not appear until the following year. This is due to the extensive growing and testing we mentioned in the beginning. Plants go from the lab actually out to the field and they need to know that in effect there has been a significant change in order to promote a cultivar. Okay, so we are fortunate to have two trial gardens within traveling distance of us. The first is 
um, the Chadwick Arboretum, which is in Columbus at Ohio State University. It's a 60 acre agricultural um, area where they are testing various plants. It's, it's a neat area just to go visit. It's well worth the drive if you're into plants, which I suspect you all are. Um, and information on that can be found online. I believe it's a dawn to dusk thing. I don't, as far as I know, there's no charge, um, but definitely look for information online. Okay, the second is a little bit farther away. This is a four hour trip. This is Pennsylvania State University um, in University Park, Pennsylvania. And um, the title actually, as you can see, is the Pennsylvania State University College of Agriculture Sciences Research Center. I tried looking that up and got nowhere. So um, try Penn State uh, or Pennsylvania University, State University Arboretum. And I would suggest that you call, I mean, it's, it's enough of a trip that you wanna know before you go. I wasn't quite clear whether the Arboretum and the trial sites were the same. You'd wanna get more information. Any questions? Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming out today. I hope you learned something. Thank you.